The passage from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians that we heard in the second reading prepares us very beautifully to contemplate this incredible act of love that is contained in the story of Jesus being handed over to death and suffering for us. St. Paul says succinctly that Jesus did not cling to his equality with God, but rather emptied himself, poured himself out for our sake. As we proceed to commemorate, to remember and make alive once again that love manifest in Jesus, incarnate in Jesus in the days ahead, as we celebrate these salvific mysteries, let's just think about that phrase. He emptied himself. He didn't cling to his equality with God. In other words, Jesus didn't have to do it. He didn't have to go through with this incredible suffering. He could have claimed the privilege that most in this world would do. After all, he was one with the Father. But his mission was to come into this world and turn this world once again towards the Father. He didn't wield any weapons. In fact, when one of his followers pulled out the sword and cut off the soldier's ear, he healed him on the spot. He told him to put those weapons away. Jesus embraced the cross that was his because he did not cling to that equality with God. Remember the first Sunday of Lent? It was the story of Jesus' temptation it was the devil himself telling Jesus, there's an easier way. You don't have to go through with this mission. Even in the vulnerable state of 40 days of fasting, Jesus recalled the authentic understanding of his unity with God and took the harder road that gains for us entrance to eternal life. Jesus, the sinless one, takes on the sins of all places, of all times, of all people in history without complaint. We marvel at the composure of Jesus. We marvel how he consistently reveals the mercy of his Father, even in his suffering. We marvel at a love that goes to that extreme when there wasn't much evidence of that love being returned or repaid. On the night before he died, when he gave us the gift of his abiding presence in the Eucharist, as his disciples, his closest friends in the world, were sitting with him at table, and he's pouring out his life as he gives them his very body to consume, as he gives them the blood that will be poured out for them to drink, they're fighting among themselves not only about who would betray him, because that sounded unthinkable, but then each of them betrayed him by denying anything that they had learned about how authority and power is exercised in the kingdom of God. They fought like little immature brats on the night that Jesus was laying down his life. He brought them in the garden to pray with them, and as sweat is forming into blood and dripping to the ground, they're sleeping until one from their number arrives with the soldiers and betrays Jesus with a kiss, one who had been with him through those three years of public ministry, one who had witnessed everything, who had seen it all. He turned Jesus over to those who had put him to death. And even Peter, the one in whom Jesus places his confidence and trust because he heard words come out of Peter's mouth that he knew were inspired that day that Peter proclaimed Jesus the Son of God. And that Peter is bold at the moment, he'll do anything, he'll go to death for Jesus, right up until somebody asks him, are you really with him? Are you one of them? And he denies it three times. When Jesus predicted Peter's denial, interestingly enough, he calls him Simon, the name from before his conversion. Simon, Satan will try to enter into you. 
Simon, you will be led astray. Simon, I'm praying for you. And then he turns and calls him Peter. He says, and when you turn back, go and strengthen your brothers. It's one of many examples of Jesus having more faith in his followers than his followers have in him. He knew Peter and he knew he would turn around and charged him with the ministry of when he does so to strengthen his brothers. It's only in Luke's telling of this story that after the rooster crows the second time, Peter and Jesus' eyes meet and Peter weeps bitterly. It was a weeping that is born of forgiveness, of mercy, because Peter in his heart knew who Jesus was and knew that he was forgiven. We hear the stories of those aligned to get rid of Jesus. First of all, the religious leaders of his own faith who were jealous of his authority, who were jealous of the crowds that he drew, who were scandalized by his association with sinners, who were offended by what he said about God's mercy, who had to do everything to destroy him, yet it wasn't in their power. They were willing to lie to the very powers that they wanted to overthrow, to the Roman government. They were willing to lie to get rid of this Jesus. And Pontius Pilate, who knew better, Pontius Pilate, who could see what was going on. Pontius Pilate, the consummate politician who read the crowds and read the scene and read the motives and knew what was the right thing to do, ends up giving in. After he passed the buck, he comes from Galilee, sent him over to Herod. Herod was someone he despised. Herod and Pilate both ridiculed Jesus but realized his innocence and then Pilate gives in to the crowds, probably to save his own neck with the authorities above him trying to prevent the destruction of a mob. Pilate gives in. But there are glimpses of hope. There are the women who follow Jesus very faithfully, a crowd of women, according to Luke, who were mourning who were suffering with Jesus, who felt what he did and worried for him, and he reminded them that he did this out of love. It was for their own children and the future generations that they should weep because some would continue to reject mercy incarnate, would reject this unconditional love. Some would still refuse to believe in a love so great ridiculed, humiliated, stripped of his garments, nailed to the cross. The words out of Jesus' mouth in Luke's gospel are again words of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. There are few words that are more hopeful in the New Testament because those words include us. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He knows the human weakness. He knows the weakness of those who are closest to him. And he continues to love with a love that is stronger than death and stronger than sin itself. His forgiveness is empowering and brings to life again. The thieves on either side of Jesus. One joins in the crowds to ridicule Jesus the other recognizes his goodness, his love, and says a prayer that should be on the lips of every one of us today, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And it's only that thief, that murderer, that victim of capital punishment who hears the words, today you will be with me in paradise. And then when Jesus confidently hands his spirit over to his father, knowing that he has accomplished his mission. He didn't take the shortcuts. He didn't cling to his equality with God. He hands over in confidence his spirit to his Father and experiences the fullness of what it means to be incarnate, the fullness of what it means to be human. He dies a real death. And he's placed in the grave. He's placed in the grave by somebody who paid attention. 
He's placed in the grave by somebody who up until that point was unwilling to come forward as a disciple of Jesus, but when it cost him the most and when it was the highest risk, he steps forward and gives Jesus, the one who had been homeless throughout his life, the one who had been born in a stable because there was no room in the inn, he gives Jesus his own grave. What else was there to give? What consolation those women and Joseph of Arimathea and Simon carrying the cross brought to Jesus in the midst of what seemed in all other terms to be a failure. You and I are failures at times in walking the path of discipleship. We can be as petty as those apostles fighting over who is the greatest. We can be as stingy as Judas. We can be as weak as Peter. We can be like the worst of the characters in this scene or with the little bit that we're capable of offering. We can be the ones that bring consolation, that bring hope. And in either case, Jesus believes in us even more than we believe.